Seminar 4, Das Dinge, Sache und Wort, Niederschriften, Nebenmensch, Fremde. I'm going to try to speak to you about the thing, das Ding. If I introduce this term, it is because there are certain ambiguities, certain insufficiencies in relation to the true meaning or in Freud of the opposition between reality principle and pleasure principle. That is to say, in relation to the material which I am trying to explore with you this year, so as to make you understand its importance for our practice as an ethics. And these ambiguities have to do with something that is of the order of the signifier and even of the order of language. What we need here is a concrete, positive, particular signifier, and I don't find anything in the French language. I would be grateful to those who might be sufficiently stimulated by these remarks to suggest a solution. Anything that could correspond to the subtle opposition in German, which is not easy to bring out, between the two terms that mean thing, das Ding un, and die Sache. One. We have only one word in French. The word is la chose, thing, which derives from the Latin word causa. Its etymological connection to the law suggests to us something that presents itself as the wrapping and designation of the concrete. There is no doubt that in German, too, the thing, in its original sense, con concerns the notion of a proceeding deliberation or legal debate. That ding may imply not so much a legal proceeding itself as the assembly which makes it possible, the Volksversammlung. Don't imag imagine that this use of etymology, these insights, these etymological soundings, are what I prefer to guide myself by, although Freud does remind us all the time that in order to follow the track of the accumulated experience of tradition of past generations, linguistic inquiry is the surest vehicle of the transmission of a development that marks psychic reality. Current practice, too, taking note of the use of the signifier in its synchrony, is infinitely precious to us. We attach a far greater weight to the way in which ding and sacha are used in current speech. Moreover, if we look up an etymological dictionary, we will find that Sacha, too, originally had something to do with a legal proceeding. Sacha is the thing that is juridically questioned, or in our vocabulary, the transition to the symbolic order of a conflict between men. Nevertheless, the two terms are not at all equivalent for that matter. You may have noted the last time in Mr. Lefebvre's Pontelis remarks, a quotation of terms whose thrust, as he brought out in his presentation, was to raise this question, seems to me, in opposition to my doctrine and it is all the more praiseworthy in his case since he doesn't know German. It had to do with the passage in Freud's article entitled The Unconscious, in which the representation of things, Sachvorstellung, is on every occasion opposed to that of words, Wortvorstellung. I will not enter today into the discussion of the factors that will allow one to respond to that passage, so often invoked at least in the form of a question mark, by those of you who are inspired by my lectures to read Freud. It is a passage which appears to them to constitute an objection to the emphasis I place on signifying articulation as providing the true structure of the unconscious. The passage in question seems to go against that, since it opposes Sachvorstellung as, opposed, as belonging to the unconscious to Wortvorstellung as belonging to the preconscious. I would just beg those who stop at that passage, the majority of you presumably do not go and verify in Freud's text what I affirm here in my commentaries, I would beg them to read together one after the other, the article called Tiefverdrängung, or Repression, which precedes the article on the unconscious, then that article itself, before arriving at the passage involved. I will note for the rest of you that it is precisely to do with the question, of, uh, with the question that the schizophrenic attitude poses for Freud, that is to say the manifestly extraordinary prevalence of affinities between words in what one might call the schizophrenic world. Everything that I have just discussed seems to me to lead in only one direction, namely that Verdrängung operates on nothing other than signifiers. The fundamental situation of repression is organized around a relationship of the subject to the signifier. As Freud emphasizes, it is only from that perspective that it is possible to speak in a precise analytical sense, I would call it operational, of unconscious or unconscious. He realizes that the special situation of the schizophrenic, more clearly than that of any other form of neurosis, places us in the presence of the problem of representation. I will perhaps have the opportunity to come back to this text later, but you will note that by offering the solution he seems to be offering in opposing Wortvorstellung to Sachvorstellung, there is a problem, an impasse, that Freud himself emphasizes and that can be explained by the state of linguistics in his time. He nevertheless understood and formulated admirably the distinction to be made between the operation of language as a function, namely the moment when it is articulated and in effect plays an essential role in the preconscious, and the structure of language as a result of which those elements are put, put in play in the unconscious are organized. In between, those coordinations are set up, those banungen, that concatenation which dominate its whole economy.
I have digressed too much. Since today, I only want to restrict myself to the remark that Freud speaks of Sachvorstellung and not Dingvorstellung. Moreover, it is no accident if the Sachvorstellung are linked to the Vorstellung, since it tells us that there is a relationship between thing and word. The straw of words only appears to us as straw insofar as we have separated it from the grain of things, and it was first the straw which bore that grain. I don't want to begin to develop being a theory of knowledge here, but it is obvious that the things of the human world are things in a universe structured by words, that language symbolic process dominate and govern all. When we seek to explore the frontier between animal and human world, it is apparent to what extent the symbolic process as such doesn't function in the animal world. A phenomenon can only be a matter of astonishment for us. A difference in the intelligence, the flexibility and the complexity of the apparatuses involved cannot be the only meaning or explanation of that absence. That man is caught up in symbolic processes of a kind to which no animal has access cannot be resolved in psychological terms, since it applies to be first of a complete and precise knowledge of what this symbolic process means. The Sacha is clearly the thing, a product of industry and of human action is governed by language. However implicit they may first be in the genesis of that action, things are always on the surface, always within range of an explanation. To the extent that it is subjacent to and implicit in every human action, that activity of which things are the fruit belongs to the pre-conscious order, that is to say, something that our interest can bring to consciousness, on condition that we pay enough attention to it, that we take notice of it. The word is there in a reciprocal position to the thing that it articulates itself, when it, it, that it comes to explain itself beside the thing to the extent also that an action which is dominated by language, indeed a command, we would have separated out this object and given it birth. Sacha and Wirth are therefore closely linked, they form a couple. That ding is found somewhere else. I would like today to show you this ding in life and in the reality principle that Freud introduces at the beginning of his thought and that persists to the end. I will point out the reference to it in a given passage of the Entwurf on the reality principle and in the article entitled Die Verneinung, or Denegation, in which it is an essential point. This ding is not in the relationship, which is to some extent a calculated one insofar as it is explicable, that causes men to question his words as referring to things which, have moreover, which they have moreover created. There is something different in das ding. What we find in das ding is the true secret. For the reality principle has a secret that, as Lefebvre point at least pointed out the last time, is paradoxical. If Freud speaks of the reality principle, it is in order to reveal to us that from a certain point of view it is always defeated. It, all, it is always defeated. It only manages to affirm itself at the margin, and this is so by reason of kind of pressure that one might say if things didn't in fact go much further. Freud calls not the vital needs, as it is often said in order to emphasize the secondary process, but the not des Lebens in the German text. An infinitely stronger phrase, something that wishes, need and not needs, pressure, urgency, the state of not is the state of emergency in life. This not des Lebens intervenes at the level of the secondary process, but in a deeper way than through that corrective agency. It intervenes so as to determine the Q eta level, the quantity of energy conserved by the organism in proportion to the response, which is necessary for the conservation of life. Take note that it is at the level of the secondary process that the level of this necessary determination is exercised. Let us return to the reality principle that is thus evoked from the point of view of its necessary necessity effect. This remark puts us on the track uh, of what I call its secret, namely the following. As soon as we try to articulate the reality principle so as to make it depend on the physical world to which Freud's purpose seems to require us to relate it, it is clear that it functions, in fact, to isolate the subject from reality. We find in it nothing more than that which biology, in effect, teaches us, namely that the structure of a living being is dominated by a process of homeostasis, of isolation from reality. Is that all Freud has to tell us when he speaks of the functioning of the reality principle? Apparently, yes. And he shows us that neither the quantitative element nor the qualitative element in reality enters the realm, the term he uses is Reich, of the secondary process. Exterior quantity enters into contact with the apparatus called the phi system, that is to say, that part of the whole neuronic apparatus which is directly turned to the exterior, or roughly speaking, the nerve ends at the level of the skin, the tendons and even the muscles and bones, deep sensitivity. Everything is done so that the Q quantity is definitely blocked, stopped in relation to that which is supported by another quantity, the Q eta quantity. The latter determines the level that distinguishes the psi apparatus within the neuronic whole. For the n is, in fact, the theory of a neuronic apparatus in relation to which the organism remains exterior, just as much as the outside world. Let us turn to quality. 
There too the outside world doesn't lose all quality, but as the theory of the sensory organ shows, this quality is inscribed in a discontinuous way, according to a scale cut off at each end and shortened in relation to the different sensory fields in question. A sensory apparatus, Freud tells us, doesn't only play the role of extinguisher or shock absorber like the phi apparatus in general, it but also plays the role of sieve. He doesn't go any further in the direction of potential solutions to these problems that belong to the domain of the physiologist of the man who wrote The Sensations, Monsieur Pierron. The question of whether, in the field, likely to provoke visual, auditory or other perceptions, the choice is made in this or that is not pursued further. Still, we have here also the notion of a deep subjectivization of the outside world, something sifts, sifts in such a word way that reality is, not, is only perceived by man in his natural spontaneous state at least as radically selected. Man deals with selected bits of reality. In truth, that only occurs in a function which is localized in relation to the economy of the whole. It doesn't concern quality to the extent that it provides deeper information, that it achieves in essence, but only signs. Freud only sees them playing a role insofar as they are qualitate zeichen, but the function of sign isn't significant in relation to opaque and enigmatic reality. It is a sign to the extent that it alerts us to the presence of something that has, in effect, to do with the outside world. It signals to consciousness that it is to deal with the outside world. Consciousness has to come to terms with that outside world, and it has had to come to terms with it ever since men have existed and thought that and tried out theories of knowledge. Freud doesn't take the problem any further, except to note that it is certainly highly complex and that we are still a long way from being able to outline a solution of that which organically determines its particular genesis so precisely. But given this, is that all that is involved when Freud speaks to us of the reality principle? Is in this relation no more than that which certain theorists of behaviorism suggest to us? That kind which represents the fortunate encounters with an organism faced with a world where it doubtless finds something to eat, of which it is capable of assimilating certain elements, but which in principle made always in principle made up of random events and chance meetings, chaotic. Is that all Freud expresses when he speaks of the reality principle? That is the question I am raising here today with the notion of das Ding. Two, before going any further, I will once again draw your attention to the contents of the little table with its double column that I introduced two weeks ago. In one column there is the Lutz principle, and the other the Realitäts principle. Unconscious activity is on the side of the pleasure principle. The reality principle dominates that which, whether conscious or preconscious, is in any case present in the order of reason, discourse, articulatable, accessible, and emerging from the preconscious. I pointed out that to the extent that they are dominated by the pleasure principle, the thought processes are unconscious, as Freud emphasized. They are only available to consciousness to the extent that they can be verbalized. That a reasoned account brings them within range of the reality principle, within range of a consciousness that is perpetually alert, interested through the investment of its attention in discovering something that may happen, so as to allow it to find its bearings in the real world. It is in his own words that the subject, in the most precarious of ways, manages to grasp the ruses thanks to which his ideas are made to fit together in his thought, ideas that often emerge in the most enigmatic of ways. The need to speak them, to articulate them, introduces within them an often artificial order. Freud likes to insist on this point when he says that one always finds reasons for finding this attitude or that mood come over one after one, uh, one after another, but there is, after all, nothing to confirm. The true cause of their successive emergence is given to us. It is precisely this that analysis adds to our experience. There is always an abundance of reasons to make us believe in some rational explanation for the sequentiality of our endosake forms. However, as we know, in the majority of cases, their true connections are to be found somewhere completely different. Thus, the process of thought is to be found in the field of the unconscious. I mean that thought processes, that thought process to which access to reality finds its way, the not des Lebens, which maintains at a certain level the investment of the apparatus. It is only accessible through the artifice of the spoken word. Freud even goes further, to even goes so far as to say that insofar as relations are spoken, that we can hear ourselves speak, that there is bewegung, movement of speech. I don't think the word of the use of this word is very common in German, and if Freud uses it, it is to emphasize the strangeness of the notion he insists on. It is only insofar as this bewegung announces itself in the omega system that something may be known concerning whatever is introduced into the circuit to any degree into the circuit that at the level of the phi apparatus tends above all to discharge itself through movement so as to maintain tensions at the lowest possible level. The conscious subject is aware of what is involved in the process of ab four and appears under the sign of the pleasure principle only insofar as there is something centripetal in the movement. 
that there is a sense of movement or speech, a sense of effort, and that would be limited to a dim perception capable at the most of opposing in the world the two important qualities that Freud doesn't fail to characterize as monotonous, i.e. immobility and mobility, that which can move and that which is, is impossible to move. If certain movements of a different structure didn't exist, that is, the articulated movements of words, there is again something that is characterized by monotony, pallor, lack of color, but that is also the way everything that has to do with thought processes reaches consciousness, with those tiny attempts to proceed from forstellung to forstellung, from representation to representation, around which the human world is organized. It is insofar as something in the sensory motor circuit manages to interest the psi system at, the cert at a certain level that something is perceived retroactively, something tangible in the form of a vort forstellung. That is how the conscious system, the omega system, can register something that happens in the psyche. Freud refers to it on a number of occasions, not without caution and sometimes ambiguously, as an endopsyche perception. Let me emphasize further what is going on in the psi system. From the end forth on, Freud isolates an ich system. We will see its metamorphoses and transformations in subsequent developments of the theory, but it appears right away with all the ambiguity that Freud will reaffirm later when he says that ich, the ich is to a great extent unconscious. The ich is precisely defined in the Einfühlung, Einführung des Ichs, as a system that is uniformly invested with something which has a Gleichbesetzung. Freud did not write the term, but I am following the drift of what he says relative to an equal uniform investment. There is, in the Psi system, something which is constituted as an Ich, and which is eine Gruppe von Neuronen. The constant besetzt ist, also dem durch die sekundäre Funktion erfordenten Vorratsträger entspricht. The term Vorrat, in particular, is repeated here. The maintenance of this investment characterizes a regular function there, and I am speaking of function here. If there is an unconscious, it is the it insofar as it is an unconscious function, and we have to deal with it insofar as it is regulated by that besetzung, by that gleich besetzung. Whence the value of the decustation on which I insist, and which we will see maintained in its duality throughout the development of Freud's thought. Now, the system which perceives and registers, and which will later be called the Vernehmungsbewusstsein, is not on the level of the ego to the extent that it maintains equal and uniform and, as far as possible, constant the besetzung that regulates the functioning of thought. Consciousness is elsewhere. It is an apparatus that Freud had to invent, that he tells us is intermediary between the psi system and the phi system, yet that, at the same time, everything in the text informs us that we should not put at the boundary between them. The fact is that the psi system enters directly, doubtless through an apparatus, and spreads itself directly throughout the phi system, where it only gives up a part of the quantity that it brings with it. The omega system functions elsewhere in a more isolated position, one that is less easily situated than any other apparatus. In fact, it isn't from exterior quantity that the omega neurons extract their energy, Freud tells us. One can assume that they zik di perioda an naignen. They appropriate, that they appropriate the period. That is what I was alluding to just now when I was referring to the choice of sensory apparatus. It plays a leading, a guiding role there in relation to the contributions coming from the qualitätszeichen in order to allow, with the least movement, all those departures that are individualized as attention paid to this or that chosen point on the circuit. And that will permit a better approximation to the process than the pleasure principle would tend to make automatically. As soon as Freud tries to articulate the function of this system, something strikes us about this coupling, this union, which seems a fusion between Farnemung, perception, and Bewusstsein, consciousness, expressed in the symbol uh, W, uh, hyphen, capital BW. I enjoy you to refer to letter 52, that is the Feb point at least knows the last time I have remarked on a number of times. It is a letter in which Freud began to explain to Fleece in confidence his conception of how the unconscious must work. His whole theory of memory has to do with the sequence of Niederschriften, of inscriptions. The fundamental demand to which the whole system responds is that of ordering in a coherent conception of, in, of the psychic apparatus the different fields of which he finds effectively of that which he finds effectively functioning in the memory traces. In letter 52, Farnemung, that is to say the impression of the external world as raw, original, primitive, is outside the field that corresponds to a notable experience, namely one that is effectively inscribed in something that is quite, in something that is quite striking to note, Freud expresses right at the beginning of his thought as a neither shrift, 
something that presents itself, not simply in terms of a pregung or impression, but in the sense of something which makes a sign and which is of the order of writing. And I wasn't the one who made him choose that term. The first Nisa shift occurs at a certain age that, in his estimate, has for him to situate four, four years old, but that's not important. Later, up to the age of eight, another more organized Nisa shift, one that is organized in terms of memory, seems to me to constitute more precisely an unconscious. It's not important if Freud is right or wrong. We have seen how we can trace the unconscious and its organization is thought much further back. What is important is that next we have the level of the Vorbewusstsein, and then that of the Bewusstsein, insofar as not, it is not the sign of a time, but of a terminus. In other words, that discussion which takes us forward from a meaning of the word, of the word to speech that can be our formulated. The chain that extends from the most archaic unconscious to the articulate form of speech in the subject. All that takes place between Farnemung and Bewusstsein, between glove and hand, so to speak. The progress that interests Freud is then situated somewhere that, from the point of view of the topology of the subject, is not easily identified with a neuronic apparatus. Yet what goes on between Farnemung and Bewusstsein must, after all, have to do with the unconscious, since that's how Freud represents it to us. This time, not simply in the form of a function, but of an Aufbau, of a structure, as he puts it himself, in making the opposition. In other words, it is to the extent that the signifying structure interposes itself between perception and consciousness that the unconscious intervenes, that the pleasure principle intervenes. Yet it is no longer in the form of a like bewetzung, bewetzung, or the function of the maintenance of a certain investment, but insofar as it concerns the banungen. The structure of accumulated experience resides here, there, and is and remains inscribed there. At the level of the ink of the functioning unconscious, something regulates itself that tends to exclude the outside world. On the other hand, what is expressed at the level of übung is discharged, and one finds the same intersection as in the whole economy of the apparatus. The structure regulates the discharge, the function restrains it. Freud also calls that forat, provisions. This is the word he uses for the larder of his unconscious, of his own unconscious, forats kammer. Forat streger is the ich as the basis of the quantity of ener- and of energy that constitutes the core of the psychic apparatus. On that basis, there enters into play what we will see function at, as the first apprehension of reality by the subject. And it is at this point that the reality intervenes, which has the most intimate relationship to the subject, the neben mensch. The formula is striking to the extent that it expresses powerfully the idea of beside yet alike, separation and identity. Corson, Corson. I ought to really to read you the whole passage, but I will limit myself to the climactic sentence. Thus, the complex of the Naban men is separated into two parts, one of which affirms itself through an unchanging apparatus which remains together as a thing, as being. That's what the awful trans- French translation you have at your disposal misses when it says something remains as a coherent whole. It has nothing to do with an allusion to a coherent, to a whole that would occur in the passage from the verb to the noun, quite the contrary. The ding is the element that is initially isolated by the subject in his experience of the name and mention as being by its very nature alien, fremda. The complex of the object is in two parts. There is a division, a difference in the approach to judgment. Everything in the object that is quality can be formulated as an attribute. It belongs to the investment of the psi system and constitutes the earliest Vorstellung around which the destiny of all that is controlled by the laws of Lust and Unlust, of pleasure and unpleasure, will be played out in what might be called the primary emergences of the subject. That thing is something entirely different. We have here an original division of an experience of reality. We find it as well in Verneinung. Look it up in the text. You will find the same functions with the same significance of that which from within the subject finds itself in the beginning led towards a first outside, an outside which Freud tells us has nothing to do with the reality, with that reality in which the subject will subsequently have to locate the qualitates Zeichen, signs that tell him that he's on the right track in his search for satisfaction. That is something which even prior to this test, or the test of this search, sets up its end, goal, aim. That's what Freud indicates when he says that the first and most immediate test, goal of the test of reality, is not to find in a real perception an object which corresponds to the one which the subject represents to himself at that moment, but to find it again to confirm that it is still present in reality. The whole progress of the subject is then oriented around the ding as fremde, strange and even hostile on occasion, or in any case, the first outside. It is clearly a probing form of progress that seeks points of reference, but in relation to what? With the word of desires. 
it demonstrates that something is there after all, that, and that to a certain extent it may be useful. Yet useful for what? For nothing other than to serve as points of reference in relation to the world of wishes and expectations. It is turned towards that which helps on, second oca- on certain occasions to reach that thing. The object will be there when in the end all conditions have been fulfilled. It is of course clear that what is supposed to be found cannot be found again. It is its nature that the object as such is lost. It will never be found again. Something is there while one waits for something better or worse but which one wants. The world of our experience, the Freudian world, assumes that it is this object, that thing, as the absolute other of the subject, that one is supposed to find again. It is to be found at the most as something missed. One doesn't find it, but only its pleasurable associations. It is in this state of wishing for it and waiting for it that, in the name of the pleasure principle, the optimal tension will be sought, below which, below that, there is neither perception nor effort. In the end, in the absence of something which hallucinates it in the form of a system of reference, the world of perception cannot be organized in a valid way, cannot be constituted in a human way. The world of perception is represented by Freud as dependent on that fundamental hallucination without which there will be no attention available. 3. Here we come to the notion of the specifische action of which Freud speaks on a number of occasions, and that I would like to shed some light on here. There is, in fact, an ambiguity in the Befriedungungs Erlebnis. This, what is thought, is the object in relation to which the pleasure principle functions. This functioning is in the material, the web, the medium, to which all practical experience makes a reference. How, then, does Freud conceive of this experience, this specific action? In this connection, one has to read his correspondence with Fleece to appreciate the significance of it, and in particular, that letter referred to above, which still has a lot to tell us. He tells us that an attack of hysteria is not a discharge, it is a warning to those who always feel the need to place the emphasis on the role of quantity in the functioning of affect. There is no field more fear favorable than that of hysteria to suggest to what extent in the concatenation of psychic events a fact is a question of relative contingency. It is by no means a discharge, sondern eine Aktion, an action, moreover, which is Mittel von Reproduktion von Luster. We will see that while what Freud calls an action is made clear, the essential characteristic of any action is to be a Mittel, a means of reproduction. In its root, at least, it is this. Das ist er der hysterische Anfall, wenigstens in der Wurzel, and elsewhere, sonst motiviert er sich von der Vorbewusstsein allerlei Gründen, and actually may be motivated by all kinds of grounds which are located at the level of the pre-conscious. Immediately after Freud explains what its essence consists of, and he illustrates at the same time what an action as Mittel zur Reproduktion means. In the case of hysteria, of a crisis of tears, everything is calculated, regulated, and as it were focused on der, den andern, on the other, the prehistoric, unforgettable other that later one will no, no one will ever reach. The thoughts that we find expressed here allow us to make a first approach to the problem of neurosis and to understand its correlative or regulatory term. If one goal of the specific action which aims for the experience of satisfaction is to reproduce the initial state, to find that thing, the object again, we will be able to understand a great many forms of neurotic behavior. The behavior of the hysteric, for example, has as its aim to recreate a state centered on the object insofar as this object, that thing, is, as Freud wrote somewhere, the support of an aversion. It is because the primary object is an object which fails to give satisfaction that the specific erlebenness of the hysteric is organized. On the other hand, that is Freud's distinction, and we don't need to give it up, and in obsessional neurosis, the object with relation to which the fundamental experience, the experience of pleasure, is organized is an object which definitely gives too much pleasure. Freud perceived this clearly. It was his first apperception of obsessional neurosis. What, in its various advances and many byways, the behavior of the obsessional reveals and signifies is that he regulates his behavior so as to avoid what the subject often sees quite clearly as the goal and end of his desire. The motivation of this avoidance is often extraordinarily radical, since the pleasure principle is presented to us as possessing a mode of operation which is precisely to avoid excess too much pleasure. So as to move fast, as fast as Freud in his first apperception of ethical reality, insofar as it functions in the subject that he is dealing with, I would outline the positing of the subject in the third of the major categories that Freud distinguishes at the beginning. Hysteria, obsession, and neurosis, and paranoia. As far as paranoia is concerned, Freud gives us the term that I invite you to reflect on as it first emerged, namely 
Verzagen des Glaubens. The paranoid doesn't believe in that first stranger in relation to whom the subject is obliged to take his bearings. The use of the term belief seems to me to be emphasized in a less psychological sense than first seems to be the case. The radical attitude of the paranoid, of the paranoid as designated by Freud, concerns the deepest level of the relationship of man to reality, namely that which is articulated as faith. Here you see how easily how the connection with a different perspective is created that comes to meet it. I already referred to it when I said that the moving force of the parano of paranoia is essentially the rejection of a certain support in the symbolic order, of that specific support around which the division between the two sides of the relationship to das thing operates, as we will see in subsequent discussions. Das thing is that which I will call the beyond of the signified, it is as a function of this beyond the signified and an emotional relationship to it that the subject keeps its distance and is constituted in a kind of relationship characterized by its pri by primary affect prior to any repression. The whole initial articulation of the entorf takes place around it. Let us not forget that repression still posed a problem for Freud, and everything that he would subsequently say about repression in its extraordinary sophistication can only be understood as, corresp as responding to the need to understand the specificity of repression compared to all other forms of defense. It is then in relation to the original ding of the first, that the first orientation, the first choice, the first seat of subjective orientation takes place, that I would sometimes call neuron val, the choice of neurosis. That first grinding will henceforth regulate the function of the pleasure principle. It remains for us to see that it is in the same place that something which is the opposite, the reverse, and the same combined is also organized, and which in the end substitutes itself for that dumb reality which is that thing, that is to say, the reality that commands and regulates. That is something which emerges in the philosophy of someone who, better than anyone else, glimpses the function of that thing, even though he only approached it by the path of a philosophy of science, namely Kant. In the end, it is conceivable that it is as a pure signifying system, as a universal maxim, as that which is the most lacking in a relationship to the individual, that the features of das thing must be presented. It is here that, along with Kant, we must see the focal point, aim, and convergence, according to which an action that we will qualify as moral will present itself, and which, moreover, we will see present itself paradoxically as a certain, as the rule of a certain gut or good. Today I will simply emphasize this. The thing only presents itself to the extent that it becomes the word, hits the bullseye, as they say, the pun is In Freud's text, the way in which the stranger, the hostile figure, appears in the first experience of reality for the human subject is the cry. I suggest we do not need this cry. Here I would like to make a reference to something that is more inscribed in the French than in the German language. Each language has its advantages. The German das Wort word is both le mot and la parole in French. The word le mot has a particular weight and meaning. Mot refers essentially to no response. Mot says La Fontaine somewhere, is what remains silent. It is precisely that in response to which no word is spoken. The things in question are things insofar as they are dumb. Some people might object that these things are placed by Freud at a higher level than the world of signifiers that I have described as the true moving force of the functioning of man, of that process designated as primary. And dumb things are not exactly the same as things which have no relationship to words. It is enough to evoke a face which is familiar to every one of you that of the terrible dumb brother of the four Marx brothers, Harpo. Is there anything that poses a question which is more present, more pressing, more absorbing, more disruptive, more nauseating, more calculated to trust everything that takes before us into the abyss or the void than the face of Harpo Marx, that fail with its smile, which leaves us unclear as to whether it signifies the most extreme perversity or complete simplicity? This dumb man alone is sufficient to sustain the atmosphere of doubt and of radical annihilation, which is the stuff of the Marx brothers' extraordinary farce, and the un uninterrupted play of jokes that makes their activity so valuable. Just one more thing. I have spoken today of the other as Das Ding. I would like to conclude with something that is much more accessible to our experience, and that is the isolated use that French reserves for certain forms of pronoun of interpolation. What does the emission, the articulation, the sudden emergence from out of our voice of the you, toi, mean? A uh, toi may suddenly appear in our um, lips at the moment of utter helplessness, distress, or surprise, in the presence of something that I will not call right off death, but that is certainly for us an especially privileged other, one around which our principal concerns, gra concerns gravitate, and which for all that still manages to embarrass us. I do not think that this you is simple, this you of devotion, 
that other manifestations of the need to cherish occasionally comes up against. I believe that one finds in that word the temptation to tame the other, that prehistoric, that unforgettable other, which suddenly, th suddenly threatens to surprise us and cast us down from the height of appearance. You contains a form of defence, and I would say that at the moment that it is spoken, it is entirely in this you and nowhere else that one finds what I have evoked today concerning that ding. So as not to end with something that might seem to you so optimistic, I will focus on the weight of the identity of the thing and the word that we can find in another isolated use of the word. To the you, which according to me tames, but tames nothing, a you of vain incantation of fruitless connection, there corresponds what may happen to us when some orders come from beyond the apparatus where there lurks, that which along with ourselves has to do with that thing. I am thinking of what we answer when we are made responsible or accountable for something. Moi? Me? What is this me, this me all by itself? If it is not a me of apology, a me of refusal, a me, that's not simply not for me. Thus from its beginning, the I, as thrust forth in an antagonistic movement, the I is defence, the I is primarily and above all an I that refuses and denounces rather than announces, the I of, is the, in the isolated experience of its sudden emergence, which is also perhaps to be considered in its original design, this I is articulated here. I will speak about this I again the next time in order to explore further the way in which moral action presents itself as an experience of satisfaction. End of seminar 4, December the 9th, 1959.